One of the sources I used for this presentation is the book titled Notorious RBG. The title is a twist on the name of a rap star, Notorious B.I.G., whose lyrics have been used for chapter titles. This seems somewhat unusual for a biography of the Supreme Court justice, but then Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an unusual Supreme Court justice. Who else has had cocktails named for them? Or an action figure named Rap Hover Ginspot on the Cartoon Network? Who else is pictured on t-shirts? Painted on fingernails? And emblazoned on greeting cards? Hundreds of RBG Halloween costumes come in baby and adult sizes. There is a Lego figure, a Ben and Jerry's ice cream, coloring book, devotional candle, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg Disney princess. This is joining princesses Hillary Clinton and Jane Goodall among other notable women. And there's even Ruth portrayed as superwoman. No other justice has captured the public's imagination in this way. The film titled On the Basis of Sex starred Felicity Jones as Ruth and Army Hammer as her husband, Marty. Justin Thoreau and Kathy Bates are also in the cast. So even if you've seen the film and a CNN documentary titled RBG, which was shown at the Sundance Film Festival, I hope I can tell you something you don't already know. On March 15th, 1933, Joan Ruth Bader, nicknamed Kiki because she was a Kiki baby, was born in Brooklyn. Since there were several girls named Joan in her elementary classrooms, she became known as Ruth. She was an outstanding student who loved to read, but learning to write was traumatic for left-handed Ruth. She was reduced to tears when her teacher was determined to convert her to using her right hand. This resulted in a D in penmanship, the only D she ever received. After that year, she vowed to never write another word with her right hand, and she never did. She envied boys who got to take shop classes instead of cooking and sewing. Eighth grade girls were required to make their own graduation dresses. She describes hers as such a mess that her mother hired a dressmaker to fix it before graduation. She was a major red in high school, and she's been described as beautiful and popular. As editor of the school newspaper, her column was quite different from those written by other students. For example, eighth grader Ruth wrote about five of history's great documents, the Ten Commandments, the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and the United Nations Charter. Her high school yearbook predicted that one class member would be a Supreme Court justice. However, it wasn't Ruth. Ruth's reverence for justice and learning was part of her Jewish heritage, but she also resented what she saw as rigid adherence to seemingly hypocritical rules and to the inferior role assigned to women. When her cousin Richard had a bar mitzvah, there was no comparable ceremony for her. Ruth's mother had been born in New York four months after her family fled the Austro-Hungarian Empire. She was the fourth of seven children even though she graduated from high school with top grades at the age of 15, her parents' dreams were for her brother. Part of her earnings as a bookkeeper in the garment district went to his tuition at Cornell. Even as a young girl, Ruth felt the sharpness of her mother's disappointment in her own prospects. One important lesson her mother taught her was always be independent. After her mother's death, which was the day before her high school graduation, Ruth learned that her mother had quietly scraped together 
$8,000 for her education. Haunted by the depression, her mother had spread her savings among five different banks. Ruth remembers, I knew she wanted me to study hard and succeed in life, and so that's what I did. She enrolled in Cornell in the fall of 1950. Ruth soon had explored every women's bathroom on the campus, and there she would retreat to a stall until her coursework was done. There were four men to every woman at that time, and because there was a competition for women's spots, Ruth remembers that the women had to be a lot smarter than the men. But it was also important for the women to hide this. When the other girls enjoyed dating, parties, playing bridge, Ruth was studying. Her mother had wanted her to be a teacher, a solid job for a woman. After trying student teaching and deciding it wasn't for her, she took a course in constitutional law from a legendary professor who then hired her as his research assistant. When a Cornell professor was fired for refusing to cooperate with the McCarthy investigations, Ruth was horrified. Impressed by the lawyers who came to his defense, she thought about being a lawyer. That sounded like a pretty good thing. Her father worried about her decision. So few women made it. How would she support herself? However, by then she had found a good man who could support her. More importantly, he was the first who ever cared that she had a brain. Marty and Ruth had quite different personalities. Ruth was shy and contained, while Marty was the life of the party. Marty had dropped his chemistry major because it interfered with golf practice, so med school was out. Harvard Business School didn't accept women, and so they settled on law, which had been Ruth's plan anyway. However, their plans were interrupted when Marty was called to serve two years in Oklahoma at the Fort Sill base, where he would be teaching at the artillery school. Ruth struggled, oh, a job as a law firm clerk ended because she couldn't type. And so she took the civil service exam. She qualified to be a claims adjuster, but she made the mistake of mentioning that she was three months pregnant. Therefore, she was told that she could not possibly travel to Baltimore for training. And so she continued to work in the Social Security office for less money. Seeing the unfairness of petty bureaucracy, she began bending the rules just a little. When someone came in with no birth certificate, she decided if the person looked 65, a hunting or fishing license would do. After two years in Oklahoma, Ruth had to earn readmission to Harvard, which she did easily. But how could she handle law school as the mother of a toddler? A friend told her, Ruth, if you don't want to go to law school, you have the best reason in the world and no one will think the less of you. But Ruth really wanted to go to law school. She was fortunate to find a grandmotherly sitter while she was in class and then when she was studying until 4 p.m. The next hours were spent with Jane in the park for reading picture books, teaching her funny songs, A.A. A. Milne poems, bathing and feeding her. After Jane's bedtime, she returned to law books. At Harvard Law, she was one of only nine women in her class. When she and the other women were invited to a dinner at the dean's home, each one was asked to justify taking the place of a man. The women were clearly uncomfortable, and Ruth wished she could crawl under the couch. One woman coolly replied that she had thought it would be a good place to find a husband. When it was Ruth's turn, she jumped to her feet so quickly that she spilled an ashtray on the carpet. No one moved, waiting for her to speak. Uh, I wanted to know more about what my husband does so I can be an understanding and sympathetic wife, she eventually mumbled. If the dean realized she was lying, he didn't let on. 
Ruth was left feeling that she and the other women were like exotic animals in a menagerie. Some professors held ladies day when they would only call on the women with humiliating questions. One late night, Ruth found herself in the library, frantic because she was barred from a men only reading room where she needed to check a citation. She begged the guard to let her stand in the doorway while he retrieved the journal for her, but he refused. Some of the women worried that going to law school would ruin their chances of marriage. Fortunately, Marty was proud of Ruth and even bragged that she had done better than he had. He only teased her about her driving, which she agreed was terrible. And because her cooking was also pretty bad, Marty took over that responsibility. Ruth was the one woman in this photo of the Harvard Law Review in 1957-58, a distinction that her husband had not accomplished. Since then, Ruth has been granted honorary degrees by more than 30 universities. When Marty was diagnosed with cancer, he faced radical surgery and daily radiation for six weeks. Ruth threw everything into making sure he stayed on track with his studies. She asked the best note takers in his classes to make carbon copies of their notes, and then she typed them up each night. Classmates came by to argue points. Too ill to type, he would dictate his papers to Ruth. After he fell asleep around 2 a.m., Ruth would begin her own work, so she learned to get by on one or two hours of sleep. To protect Marty's future, she went to the dean to ask if his class standing could be based on his first two years. The only concession the dean would give her was the record would show he had been sick. Ruth bent the truth a little when she told Marty all was well so that he could be at ease for his exams. Marty graduated and found work as a tax attorney in New York. Determined to keep their family together, Ruth again found herself at Dean Griswold's mercy. Could she take her third year classes at Columbia and still earn a Harvard degree? Griswold refused. Once on the Columbia campus, Ruth was too afraid to even ask if the law school would grant her a degree. The handful of women at Columbia Law did not have it easy either. When one began a sentence with, I feel, the professor would cut in, women feel, men think. Harvard Law's strict transfer rules stayed in place for decades. In the late 70s, when the policy came up for fresh scrutiny, Marty wrote a letter complaining of his family's ordeal. It was published in the law record with this note appended. The Ruth in this letter is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, professor of law at Columbia and general counsel of the ACLU. Just think what she might have accomplished had she enjoyed the benefits of a Harvard degree. Even though she graduated at the top of her class, she had a hard time finding a job. She had gotten used to seeing sign-up sheets for interviews that clearly stated for men only. One firm had already hired one woman and thought that was enough for them. Ruth had only two interviews and she received no offers. She had three strikes against her. She was a woman, she was Jewish, and she was the mother of a four-year-old. One of her professors was determined to find a spot for this brilliant student. So he used a bit of blackmail with a judge for the Southern District of New York who always took his recommendations. He threatened that if he didn't take Ruth, he would never send another clerk. His previous recommendations had been young men for this elite entry-level position that involved working closely with the justices to research and draft their opinions. Ruth worked harder there than she needed to, coming in on weekends and taking work home. The judge agreed that she was one of his best clerks ever. After two years of clerking when the doors of corporate law firms had opened just a bit, Ruth made a different choice. At lunch at the Harvard Club, where women were still required to enter by a small side door, she was offered the opportunity to co-author a book about civil procedure in Sweden. And this meant she would have to become fluent in Swedish. No problem. 
Ruth wasn't sure she could find Sweden on a map, but she was nearly thir nearing 30, Jane was in first grade, and she had never lived alone or even spent much time on her own. And so it was a challenge she welcomed. The man sent to meet her at the airport walked right by her, expecting a much older woman. Her time in Sweden had a profound effect on her. She observed a world where women could work, fight back at unfair conditions, and even end a pregnancy if they felt they needed to. The government had taken an interest in freeing men and women from prescribed gender roles. When she applied for a position clerking for the Supreme Court, it did not go well. Felix Frankfurter protested. She had a couple of kids, actually only one. Her husband had been ill. He worked his clerks very hard. And he did occasionally curse. As this story has been retold, Frankfurter had demanded to know if Ruth wore pants. He despised women who wore pants. Ruth was not surprised when she was told she would not clerk on the Supreme Court. Back in New York, she was encouraged to teach civil procedure classes at Columbia and worked to overcome her shyness by speaking at international conferences. In 1963, she learned that Rutgers School of Law was looking for a woman to replace their only black professor. She recalls, the dean explained that it was only fair to pay me modestly because my husband had a very good job. She accepted and she became the second woman to teach full time at Rutgers School of Law. Her first day of teaching did not receive a glowing review from one student who complained. She delivered an endless boring monologue. At the end of the year, her students performed a skit about her in their annual faculty send up. One gave a monotonal lecture while being stripped of her clothing, completely oblivious to what was happening. Jane was now 10 years old and because of Marty's testicular cancer treatment, they had given up thoughts of a second child. Therefore, Ruth was surprised to discover she was pregnant. Having learned from her first experience, she told no one. She borrowed her mother-in-law's larger clothes and finished the year. Their son James was born on September 8th and she was soon back teaching as if nothing had changed. Today, Ruth's daughter Jane is a professor of literary and artistic property at Columbia. And James is a producer of classical recordings. In 1974, Ruth published the first ever casebook on sex-based discrimination. Until Ruth started her crusade, achieving constitutional protection against discrimination for any person other than a Black was nearly impossible. In 1980, Jimmy Carter nominated her to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Strom Thurmond was the only one to vote against her in the Judiciary Committee, and the full Senate confirmed her unanimously on June 18th. Over the years, Ruth has been involved in many cases promoting women's equality. As the chief litigator for a women's rights project from 1971 to 1980, she argued five great Supreme Court victories. January 17, 1973 was her first argument before the Supreme Court. The husband of a female Air Force lieutenant had been denied the same housing, medical, and dental benefits as female spouses. She was extremely nervous, but she realized she knew so much more about the case and topic than they did. The co-founder of the ACLU's Women's Rights Project was there with case books open ready to provide a citation if Ruth needed one. She did not. She rattled off page numbers and volumes as casually as if she were giving a friend her phone number. She concluded with a quote from an abolitionist and advocate for women's suffrage. I ask for no favor for my sex. All I ask is that our brethren take their feet off our necks. She had spoken for 10 minutes without a single interruption and there was stunned silence when she concluded. In these landmark cases, she largely transformed the constitutional status of women in America, all leading up to the day when Bill Clinton ushered her into the Rose Garden 
to announce her as nominee for the Supreme Court. Although less than 24 hours earlier, Clinton had been about to offer this nomination to a man. Mary Cuomo was Clinton's favorite, but he had asked Justice Scalia, if you were stranded on a desert island with your new court colleague, who would it be? Scalia's reply was quick and definite, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So no doubt showed on Clinton's face that morning when he introduced Ruth as a hero to the women's movement and a legal star. He said he had chosen her for being a moderate whose moral imagination had cooled the fires of her colleagues' discord. Ruth didn't mention, Clinton didn't mention the role Marty had played in securing Ruth's nomination. He had relentlessly lobbied everyone they knew in Congress or the White House in both parties, as well as Ruth's women's movement friends. During her Supreme Court confirmation hearings, several senators, both Republicans and Democrats, thanked her on behalf of their daughters for her work on gender equality. When they asked her why she used the term gender discrimination instead of sex discrimination, she explained that her secretary had admonished her I've been typing sex, sex, sex in your articles, briefs, and speeches. Let me tell you, the audience you are addressing, those men you are addressing, their first association will not be the one you are talking about. Then she suggested that the word gender would ward off distracting associations. After three days of questioning, she was exhausted, but elated. A reporter from the Chicago Tribune summed it up this way. She explained, she elaborated, she scolded, she demurred, she even laughed, and ultimately she conquered. She prepared her acceptance speech herself. There was no time for speech writers. She joined the court at a time when even working women could not get a credit card without their husband's permission. She had a step-by-step -step strategy to convince the justices that discrimination did exist. She said she felt like she was addressing kindergartners. Her voice, even in her first argument, was so impressive that it was said, it's fun to hear her go from being just a little tentative and nervous to being super forceful. The justices often eat together, sharing things brought back from their travels. Justice Kennedy had provided an 825 bottle of Opus One, a California wine, which was the reason Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg nodded off during the State of the Union. She has since decided that bottled water is a better choice for her at these lunches. Ruth and Justice Scalia enjoyed a long friendship even though they were complete opposites in many ways. Ruth once explained, I disagree with much of what he says, but I love how he says it. I often had to pinch myself to keep from laughing when he says something audacious in the courtroom. His response was, I attack ideas, I don't attack people. Although they were different, they were alike in their reverence for the court. This photograph of them riding an elephant in India in 1994 caused an uproar among her feminist friends because Scalia was sitting in front. Ruth playfully reminded them it was a matter of distribution of weight. Scalia was impressed with Ruth's interest in trying new things. When she saw a parasail from her window in the south of France, her reaction was, why not try it? Scalia observed, she's so light, I thought she would never come back down. While water rafting, it was suggested she sit in the back so she wouldn't be swept away. Her reply, I don't sit in the back. When Marty gave a party to celebrate Sue's 10 years on the court, Scalia was the only justice there. The eulogy she gave at his funeral in 2016 contained humorous memories of times the two and their spouses had shared.
Their friendship is an example of why politics should not divide us. One Saturday night, a tiny woman, barely visible in a large dome chair with her back to the audience, swirled around. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, can we, can we? The robes worn by the members of the court were designed for men with a neckline that would show their shirt collars and ties. Over the years, Ruth collected more than a dozen jabots to wear with her robes. This had started as a political statement about women on the bench. Her collection includes a glass beaded velvet bib from the Banana Republic, which was included in the gift bag Glamour Magazine gave her when she was one of their women of the year in 2012. When she wears this, her colleagues can expect a dissenting opinion. Her law clerks gave her one that has dangles and charms of gold trim, which she wears to signify a majority opinion. She found a crocheted white ring in a museum in Cape Town. Another collar is a copy of one worn by her favorite tenor, Placido Domingo. Ruth loves opera and often weeps at performances. Twice a year, she oversaw opera and instrumental recitals for the court. One of her regrets was that she lacked the talent to become a great diva. Her grade school teachers were so critical of her singing that she only dared to sing in the shower. However, when the curtain rose on act two of The Daughter of the Regiment being performed at the Kennedy Center one Saturday night, a tiny woman barely visible in a large domed chair with her back to the audience swirled around. Cheers and prolonged applause rang out before Ruth, making her official operatic debut, opened her mouth to speak as the imperious Duchess of Crackenthorpe. Her character, a non-singing role in this comedy, had come to find out if the title character was worthy of marrying her nephew. Looking frail but determined, the 83-year-old Justice read a series of qualifications what she had written herself that sounded very much like requirements for high political office. Her deadpan delivery was boosted by a microphone, but laughter from the audience occasionally drowned her out. The biggest laugh came when she asked whether Marie could produce a birth certificate. And this was an obvious reference to the birther campaign against President Obama. We must take precautions against fraudulent pretenders, she explained. After this scene, she was escorted off stage to a standing ovation, but she appeared again near the end, wearing, oh, this time wearing a white powdered wig. Hearing that Marie had decided to marry Tonio instead of the Duke, she exclaimed, the scandal, and retreated to the chair, fanning her song vigorously as the curtain fell. Led back on stage during the curtain calls, one of the most influential and revered women in America smiled and curtsied three times. She had been asked to appear in all eight performances, but she declined citing her day job. Her style off the bench has been praised by fashion editors. One said she looked more pulled together than any woman in Washington since Jackie Kennedy. Rarely does she dress casually. She favors black or white lace blouse and usually carries a copy of the Constitution in her handbag. During one snowstorm in Washington, the justices were transported to the court in Jeeps. When Ruth appeared wearing a straight skirt and high heels, the driver had to lift her up and deposit her in the car. She later wrote him a recommendation for law school. 
Although she is small and looks frail, she has an impressive workout routine. There's even a book picturing this. Wearing her judicial robes, purple leggings, and her trusty sneakers, she begins with a five minute warm up on the elliptical rider, followed by one legged squats and planks as her instructor does his best to knock her over. In a recent interview, Charlie Rose was incredulous when she mentioned planks. You do planks, he questioned. Yes, she replied, slightly miffed, front and side. Her trainer then has her sit on a bench holding a 12 pound ball. She had started with a two pound ball and worked her way up. She stands holding the ball close to her chest, then tossing it to her trainer. He hands it back to her and explains, I don't want to take the chance that it misses and hits her. Just think of the paperwork I would have to fill out. She sits, then stands, and the exercise is repeated 10 times. The purpose is to prevent her from reaching the point when she cannot sit on the toilet and get back up without help. And she does the Canadian Air Force exercises nearly every day. An RBG workout featured on TV. Her trainer, Bryant Johnson, is an Army reservist whose day job is a court clerk in Washington. She began working with him in 1999 when her husband told her she looked like the survivor of a concentration camp following treatment for colorectal cancer. In 2009, a routine CAT scan indicated cancer in her pancreas. Surgery on February 5th caught a tiny malignancy and she was back in court on February 23rd. When Marty died in 2010, she returned to court 24 hours later. She saw this as a tribute to Marty for the job that he had helped her get. In 2015, she experienced chest pains during her workout. A stent was implanted and four days later, she was back on the bench. Her goal was to outlast Trump's presidency so he wouldn't Her goal was to, oh, 